uh, many people are using uh, DNA sequencing results uh, to ask about what their uh, predisposition is to different kinds of diseases. So an understanding of DNA science here means that there's uh, appreciation for the fact that DNA information is critical, genetic information is critical, but it does not mean you are predestined to have a particular disease or a condition. Just because uh, a certain DNA landmark is there, like a mutation or other kind of change, uh, that is associated with disease. So DNA by itself is not destiny. Uh, that's very much dependent on the interaction of that DNA with the environment that you live in, the environment of uh, your own uh, physical experience as you go through uh, as you go through life. So it's not an automatic uh, destiny. Uh, policymakers and, and the general public that doesn't have that grounding in understanding what the limits of uh, biotechnology tells you, especially in the area of DNA and genetics, if you don't have that background, the uh, policy guidance isn't there, uh, and the, the major questions are usually associated with that. Uh, what do you do with the information that's been presented to you? In recent years, the FDA has become uh, very savvy to this. The FDA is the uh, Food and Drug uh, Administration that has authority over medical products in the United States and can approve or disapprove or reject or seize uh, products in uh, uh, drug products or diagnostic products. And they've established policies that uh, that kind of information can't be given to a consumer uh, without the genetic counseling available to help understand what, if anything, you can do about the prevalence of a disease because it shows up in a particular DNA report. So that's a step in the right direction. And that hits on the uh, aspects of bioethics, uh, and bioinformatics is the uh, ability to sort through all the DNA information, making the algorithms that help identify what's going on there at the sequence level. The other uh, disciplines uh, that are that have made very good use of uh, progress in DNA technologies in the area of forensics, uh, that's become commonplace uh, to ask about DNA evidence at uh, any given crime scene, where the presence of uh, DNA from a perpetrator or other people involved at a crime scene, if there's skin cells that have been shed, uh, if there's blood uh, left at the scene, if there uh, is anything recoverable uh, from the physical interaction between a person and the crime scene, the techniques have evolved over the years to be able to recover that DNA, no matter how uh, small a quantity it is, and to be able to extract identity information from that, so that with high certainty, uh, an individual uh, can be identified is being linked to a particular crime scene, so there's something to explain at least. But why, why is your DNA, why does this mean, why is your DNA there, why, uh, why were you present for a certain crime scene? The same kind of uh, identification properties can also be used in medicine to identify uh, bad actors like bacteria that cause disease, viruses that cause disease, uh, those can be identified and appropriate treatments done. And the same now applies in cancer biology, where in the past couple of years there have been great advances in being able to correlate specific, uh, specific genetics, the individual DNA sequence uh, of a tumor, to line that up with the probability that that tumor with, with that particular mutation will respond in a favorable, favorable way to medicine. And so, uh, in the past couple of years, uh, treatments for uh, advanced lung cancer uh, have become available uh, that are matched with a certain mutation. And um, there are diagnostic tests that allow for uh, the sequencing of the DNA from an individual tumor. Uh, techniques and, and information that uh, was uh, not even within reach uh, as recently as uh, five to ten years ago. So that, that has progressed very rapidly. Um, the field is also 
that's touched by uh, advances in DNA science is anthropology. And this is where it begins to touch on, uh, that information begins to touch on philosophical and even theological problems. In particular with uh, uh, anthropology, the advances in, in DNA sequencing information has made it possible to track uh, the, the path and the timing of human migration uh, ever since humans uh, emerged as, as its own uh, species over 100,000 years ago, when Homo sapiens became a distinct uh, species on the Earth. In uh, the overlap with certain theological problems, uh, we look towards um, creation stories uh, as a source of um, uh, myth building in a good way, which is the storytelling that helps us interpret experience. So in Genesis, we have, of course, the familiar Adam and Eve story, uh, and the, uh, the idea that all of us are related from this moment, that all uh, humankind kind of flows from, uh, from those initial people on this earth. And it's widely accepted in, uh, in interpreting that text that uh, this is poetic imagery. If we fast forward into uh, the past 10 years, with the advances in uh, DNA sequencing. Uh, it's been possible to go and sequence the DNA of human remains uh, that are found either as part of uh, fossils, uh, bone fragments that remain, uh, the use of um, tools where, where DNA uh, might be embedded and preserved over time, a variety of uh, uh, methods in anthropology, that physical anthropology, that reveal these things. There's been limited ways to extract information uh, from these samples in the past. When there was a major study published about 10 years ago um, that tracked uh, many thousands of, of such remains that were retrieved over the years, uh, it, it built the case, the data pointed towards the fact that all of these uh, samples could be traced to a single maternal source. Uh, that, data was consistent with having one uh, female as the uh, progenitor for all of these samples uh, that were generated in time over many, many tens of thousands of years uh, separated in time. They all pointed toward this common ancestor. Uh, and it was published in the uh, well-known uh, scientific journal uh, Nature, uh, published in England. And uh, under the, there's a cover story under the, uh, the title uh, The Eve Hypothesis. So something from, uh, uh, it's taken as, as poetic imagery from sacred text, all of a sudden comes to have a new meaning once the tools of DNA technology are applied. So there's a little bit of that intersection. The, uh, the other point to leave you on this is that in the, uh, especially the current political atmosphere, there's a lot of uh, debate about uh, policymakers at the government level. Uh, policymakers making decisions based on science. Are, are facts in place? Are policies following uh, established facts? And especially in uh, environmental science with the, uh, global uh, climate change, uh, you frequently hear the assertion that uh, the science in a certain area is settled settled science. And that kind of betrays a uh, misunderstanding of uh, what the limits of scientific inquiry are. Uh, it's very rare that uh, a question can be considered, uh, especially in biology, uh, can be considered settled. And the reason for that is that it takes time. Uh, something becomes settled or an established fact once it can be reproduced over and over again by different uh, investigators under a completely independent uh, circumstances. So usually somebody comes up with an observation, they've done it with certain materials, they've done it with certain uh, methods, they publish it. It doesn't become settled until many people who are independent from that, that observation uh, try their hand at it with materials that they've made with samples that they want to investigate and control and come up with those same conclusions uh, when they set up the, the investigation in a similar way. That's what leads to um, to settled science. And uh, for my own 
work, I found it more informative to look at uh, all these all these different tools, all these different approaches to understanding human experience, science, art, they, as one, uh, as a continuum, as a spectrum, not as polar opposites, not as things that are in conflict, but that are tools on a spectrum of just trying to deal with the basic human desire of knowledge. And each brings a set of tools to help understand what human experience is like. Science excels at providing explanations about the human experience, the interaction of what life is like on Earth in the natural world, or the dynamics in the natural world. And we have to rely on other tools when we begin to try to describe experience uh, uh, that is apart and away from uh, the natural world. I'm going to uh, skip over some of the, uh, the slides there, and these will be on hand if you wish to refer to them uh, in the future. But the uh, terminology uh, section that I was going over had more um, to do with setting the stage for understanding this life cycle picture of DNA. So for our purposes, before delving into some other uh, applications of uh, DNA science. The, the basic understanding of how uh, genetic information is accessed is best summarized in this, uh, in this life cycle diagram. So genes are the uh, only a one part of the genetic information available in our total DNA. Uh, our total DNA, meaning all of the DNA uh, in our genomes, that means all of the DNA present in our 23 pairs of chromosomes each uh, amounts to a DNA sequence of uh, 3 billion base pairs of information. That's the, uh, that's the structure of that DNA. The other feature of it is that it's laid out in a specific sequence. The sequence matters. And so it's useful to think of DNA language as a uh, First of all, as a language, with an alphabet made up of these repeating uh, chemical subunits, four of them, uh, deoxynucleotides, A, T, C, and G, that are base paired specifically, three billion base pairs of information, it's laid out in a, in a specific sequence. A gene is that part of the DNA that has some meaningful information that eventually states the blueprint for making typically a protein, something functional uh, within a cell. So the DNA uh, is, the, is the code that stores the useful information. Uh, that, that information, that blueprint, is translated into a message. That's what the, uh, the ENCODE uh, term stands for. That there is, in the language of DNA, uh, a way to encode the blueprint for making proteins. That's translated to a, a messenger molecule that's uh, RNA, that's ribonucleic acid. That is in turn transported out from the chromosomal area of the cell uh, in the nucleus uh, out into the cytoplasmic space uh, to go towards uh, protein synthesis. And that's where the message then serves as the building block to build uh, a sequence specific protein. And proteins accomplish the work in a cell. They give it form, they give it function. Uh, the, the, the reason organs look the way they do, the reason they function that they do, is that there's a specific set of proteins that are put together in a certain way. They, when they come together, they accomplish this function. Whether it's a liver and processing all kinds of uh, metabolic uh, uh, pathways uh, in daily existence, or it's a heart that's pumping uh, blood, or blood itself circulating through uh, our systems, uh, all of these are the result of uh, the appropriate program that builds the proteins at the right place in the right time uh, to accomplish that. In addition, proteins uh, also serve in a way to monitor progress on how things are going with making that protein. That's where this regulatory function comes in, where they can circle back 
uh, interact with the uh, chromosomal machinery and shut off the um, instructions that have been accessed, saying that we've reached a certain threshold, we have enough of what we need, uh, it's time to uh, shut that down. There's also some historical context to realize. The advances that we've been talking about are uh, the rapid advances once DNA sequencing was uh, available and uh, available to be done at a high speed, a high rate of speed, and with high anchors. But it's also humbling to realize that uh, in, it wasn't until the mid 20th century, <coughs> mid 20th century, that um, DNA was identified as the basis of what was the basis of genetic inheritance. So for centuries before that, it was understood that in, in human relationships or in uh, uh, plants, in the animal world, there's that relationship between parent and child uh, that, uh, that it was possible just to observe that physical characteristics of children came reasonably and with high confidence with visual evidence uh, physical characteristics could come uh, from parents, from one or the other or both, uh, and, and to be resident in individual children. And the same is true of whether plants are being cultivated. Uh, it, it's true at the uh, microbiological level with bacteria, yeast, and viruses, all of that, that remains true uh, by observation. But it was not established what that unit of of inheritance was. What was the exact chemical that was giving rise to that? And it wasn't until the 50s that it was established that DNA itself was the chemical agent that was responsible for carrying inherited information. So that was a key breakthrough. It came on the heels of structural information in 1953, uh, the work of Watson and Crick and, and many collaborators uh, in establishing what the structure of DNA was. So that set the stage for being able to uh, approach DNA science for structure and function in a, in a very uh, meaningful way. And by the 1960s, it became much more established about um, how DNA gave rise, it was that life cycle diagram, the DNA gave rise to a messenger uh, molecule that then served as the blueprint for, um, for making proteins in a cell. And the last uh, advance uh, that uh, propelled us finally into sort of the current situation with current capabilities was the ability to determine what the sequence of DNA was. So at this point, uh, until the mid-70s, it was not a easily tractable problem at all. And um, thanks to some uh, Advances, it became possible to generate that information, uh, albeit at a very uh, slow pace and with low amounts of information, uh, 100 base pairs at a time, uh, if things work properly, uh, generated over the course of days. These were the, uh, the baby steps that were necessary to be able to take that technology uh, into the current age. So with uh, the arc of um, where my, my work has gone, uh, I kept going in a, uh, with the life sciences uh, with a bachelor's degree in biology and then uh, graduate school in uh, doing PhD work in uh, cell and molecular biology. And in hindsight, I would have uh, taken some time in between uh, those two, two things, uh, mainly because to advance a, a laboratory career, uh, it's experience and familiarity with techniques which are really important. And there's only one way to, to get that, and that is to work in a lab uh, for some period of time to gain that experience. And so there was, in hindsight, uh, I think a better, uh, more confidence-building path would have been after college to work for a few years uh, in a laboratory, usually in a university setting, those are set up as operations that are directed by a, the work is directed by a professor and supported by a number of uh, postdoctoral associates uh, who uh, determine the experiments and kind of help with data interpretation and, and 
tell the story of what that data is, is saying. Uh, and there's room for people to, to get the work done, and that's at the level of the, of the technician. We're not in charge of uh, running the whole program for the laboratory, but it's the very important work of getting the experimental data done to get the data out there in a reliable way. Uh, and that would have been a much more confidence building way to start, because when I joined my uh, class in graduate school, I was the only one who was going straight through from uh, finishing an undergraduate degree to, to, to start that program. And most of the folks that were in that program had worked as technicians between five and ten years. And so that was, uh, until I got my uh, technical confidence up, that was uh, uh, a shaky way to start. And hindsight could have been uh, done in a much more useful way. Uh, by the time I was done with a, a postdoctoral fellowship some years later, uh, all I knew is that I didn't want to continue down an academic path. And there was no guidance at the time for uh, what, to, what to do otherwise. Biotechnology was still, as an industry, was still in its very early phase. And so there was no, no pathway to say, okay, if you don't want to do academic research, here's a bunch of options for you. Uh, I had no idea how companies work and how products are made. Um, within such companies and, and what different kind of roles um, one can have. And so that, uh, that in part uh, spoke to what I wanted to share with you as kind of a starting point, is just to realize that um, uh, there, there are many ways that uh, familiarity and some exposure and, and some level of expertise with, with uh, DNA science and cell and molecular biology that can be put to use in a number of different uh, uh, different applications, including uh, with, especially with, uh, with biotechnology companies. So I had the good fortune of uh, getting a job with uh, Promega to make that start within a few months of, of deciding that. Uh, and uh, those are the three companies that I've worked with so far, and uh, I've been with Lucigen for uh, the past uh, five years. But I've been in the business for 28 years in, in Madison. Uh, I want to go over some of the uh, outcomes of that work. Promega was on the uh, forefront of developing DNA applications. So I had come from the mindset that a biotechnology company, I was a customer of Promega's before I, I became an employee, and I had been a customer of their products. They develop products that are used uh, in a toolbox fashion uh, to manipulate DNA so that it, uh, information can be extracted from that uh, in various experiments. So you literally shop from a catalog for what you needed. It helped with cloning and expressing those genes, and that all made, made sense. Uh, the Probate uh, business leaders had the foresight to realize that uh, DNA science had this application in forensics, and they, they were responsible in large part for establishing forensic uh, DNA capability in the United States uh, over the course of the late 1980s and into the 90s. The uh, practical application of that was that the, that meant the customer, the new customer to this kind of industry was the FBI laboratories and different uh, state crime laboratories that had programs like that for uh, uh, DNA identification. And the uh, that played out in a couple of uh, visible ways. Promega manufactured kits that were used in the O.J. Simpson trial uh, when he was on trial for a double murder in the late 90s. And that, that crime scene evidence was processed with reagents that we were making in Madison, Wisconsin, and was used by the DNA testing laboratory uh, that the state of California employed during the trial. Uh, there was a much more uh, intense and, and poignant use of that uh, after the attacks in New York City in 9-11 uh, when the Twin Towers fell, the uh, state of New York at that point, uh, uh, that particular uh, crime lab was being called in, into service. Uh, the reason is that it became quickly apparent that uh, there were no, other than the victims who were uh, able to escape the building in time before the collapse, there were no, not going to be very many, if any, uh, survivors of that 
uh, collapse of those towers. And then the mission, the work at Ground Zero was one of recovery of, uh, of victim remains. And that teed up the need to be able to identify those remains. Uh, the state of New York did not have the capability at that time, and Promega uh, stepped in and had the opportunity to establish a forensic testing laboratory at Ground Zero to help in the identification of remains. And that, uh, uh, that brought a powerful mission uh, to that doorstep of the company, and it, was, it wasn't hard to convince people to, uh, to work very hard to make sure the products were right and delivered on time. Um, so that, that that work could uh, proceed. And Exact Sciences uh, had the opportunity to move into the field of molecular diagnostics, and this is the area of uh, understanding uh, how cancer, uh, colon cancer proceeds in particular, and how that information can be used to, as a screening test, to identify those at risk for either developing colon cancer or treating, uh, treating the disease if they were present. Uh, currently, uh, the product that's being marketed is called ColoGuard. It's been on the market for a couple of years. Uh, there's a TV ad that's running nationally. You may have, you may have seen that. And it affects uh, uh, basically all folks uh, over the age of 50 are advised to uh, screen if there's no other problem going on to screen for colon cancer. That's done with a very uncomfortable uh, an invasive test called uh, colonoscopy. Um, usually uh, some uh, form of anesthetic is used. It's a surgical procedure that is based on, on looking inside the colon and seeing if there's any evidence of cancer or uh, polyps that, uh, that can develop in the cancer. Uh, this, uh, the test that was developed by Exact was to extract that information instead from stool DNA. And so that was an advance that puts a preventive tool uh, into, uh, into American medicine, and it uh, uh, principally speaks to those, there are many folks who just avoid having to do it just because of the discomfort and the, uh, and the invasive nature of the test, and there's some physical risks to go with it. Uh, some folks avoid getting screened, and there's no reason uh, that anybody should be really affected in a bad way by colon cancer. It's, it's highly treatable, and the more tools that can be thrown at uh, investing uh, in identification of that, uh, better. I want to close with just a couple of other uh, applications. The companion diagnostics I already mentioned, that's associating uh, tumor mutations uh, with particular treatments. Uh, again, those advances in advanced lung cancer and, and melanoma and prostate cancer are on the market today. Uh, that means that uh, an affected tumor can be sequenced if a mutation is present. Uh, that's good evidence that a certain kind of new treatment uh, will help that situation. Uh, and the last part is the concept of the microbiome. Uh, this is an advance in uh, human uh, health, understanding human health, that in large part advanced because of advances in uh, rapid DNA identification. So it turns out uh, most of the biomass that's present in our digestive systems uh, is, is bacterial. And it's part of the natural flora, that's the natural makeup it's a symbiotic relationship with a set of bacteria uh, that help accomplish metabolism and, and other biological functions. Sometimes that, uh, and that's, that environment is called a microbiome. Through sequencing, it's been possible to identify in patients who suffer from chronic diseases from allergy, asthma, uh, to even uh, uh, chronic uh, other chronic diseases such as diabetes and so forth uh, associated with uh, resistance to insulin treatment uh, and even autism, that distinct changes in that microbiome correlate with the disease. And that kind of advance changes the understanding of how such diseases might be treated. 
So by reestablishing the right pattern of bacteria in a patient, that may lead to curing a particular chronic disease that before was not understandable in, in its origins or even why or how, uh, how it could be treated in a, in a really reasonable way. So those were, those were the highlights of where uh, my work has taken me. Um, are there questions that uh, you might have for me? Either about how careers in that type of field develop or its application in medicine or anything? Yes, sir. Uh, so the question was, uh, what attracted me to the, to the field of study? I got interested, so my initial motivation uh, in, in pursuing a biology degree as an undergraduate was really from a pre-med point of view. I thought for many years that I'd like to pursue a, a career in medicine. And as the classes progressed into uh, cell biology and then uh, development biology, which is uh, how to humans and other, other organisms, what are the initial steps after uh, fertilization takes place to, to grow an embryo, to have an embryo develop into a, into a complete person, uh, all of those uh, biological steps. Uh, and especially when the, the DNA role, the genetic role came into play, uh, I, uh, for me, what it attracted it to me was that it was a uh, very elegant kind of explanation. It was kind of a beautiful story that was emerging and uh, began to answer questions about uh, human identity and kind of the origins of life. So uh, what took me away from just the medicine path was just those kind of uh, more of the philosophical appeal of it. Uh, and as the, that happened to coincide with advances in DNA technology, and it became apparent that that might be too a variety of interesting things in beyond medicine. So that's what got me started on that. Yes? Yeah, the question is, uh, has it been uh, continually interesting throughout the different uh, kind of jobs? And, uh, it has, and, that, and the reason is, is that it continues to kind of find these different applications. Uh, what attracted me to my current position in the past five years with Lucigen uh, has been to develop tools uh, using DNA analysis uh, where no such tools existed before. So with this C. difficile disease, uh, it was to put uh, those tools in the hands of nursing homes and other places where these kind of infections occur. Uh, and so luckily, the appeal has been that the applications are the, are the most interesting thing of all. Yes? Uh, which of my jobs has been the most interesting for me? The, uh, from uh, kind of a satisfying point of view, uh, with exact, I was able to see something from its, as a, especially a test, a diagnostic test, to go uh, join a team that was able to take uh, a concept and turn that into a marketable product with FDA approval in four years. Uh, so that's by context with other kinds of timelines, that's uh, really, they're just kind of um, super fast. And that was especially very satisfying to be a part of that. Yes, and so this uh, is kind of 
talk was meant to kind of lead to exactly that, which is how, how biotechnology organization is organized. Mm -hmm. So it exactly happens that way. So scientists typically with PhD backgrounds are on the, at the uh, on research and development departments. Mm -hmm. The mission of research and development is twofold. The research part is discovery, which is how a certain technology might be able to solve a problem. Development is the task of turning something that's technically feasible into a product that can be commercialized. Uh, my role is not in the laboratory. I haven't been in the laboratory in, in uh, 30 years. Uh, I'm on that uh, the sort of business management side of it to make sure that the research project is structured right and handy in the right way. When that product is ready and turned over to manufacturing, uh, it's one of my jobs to make sure that the instructions make sense and that whatever product it is can be made reliably over and over again. Uh, that's the basis of being able to build a good business is to uh, not disappoint customers with products that have variable quality to it. Uh, the way uh, product development typically goes is it's staffed by a cross-functional team. There's an R&D scientist. There's somebody, a senior manufacturing person, who's going to have to make sure that it can be made reliably. There's a quality person from my organization that tries to help put the whole thing together. And then someone in marketing whose job it is to figure out how, which product to develop and how to a lot of business opportunities in that. In that. First here, and then uh, one question in the back. So how long does it take to uh, normally take to develop a new application? Um, it's pretty much application dependent, but with the tools that are getting better in the past 10 years, um, that you could bring uh, those advanced tools to a new problem. And that's how an application is developed. That can be it's still a, a, a matter of a few years, so something in the two to five years to kind of break the ground in those tools. Has, uh, has I, I know certain parts of the DNA are patented, and therefore you have limitations whether you can do uh, DNA research on it. Has that been a big obstacle for you and for what you have done, and how do you overcome that? Yep, so uh, the question is, uh, the DNA landscape is uh, covered with a lot of patents. It uh, freezes out the ability to work in a certain area uh, for an X period of time. Uh, it is, uh, in general, for the companies I've been with, uh, luckily has not been a barrier. Uh, but that's because usually uh, good creativity is spurned by, or, or not spurned rather, but is spawned Instead, it's given rise to how to respond to given constraints. And usually, with any kind of patent situation, uh, there's a creative way around it. It's legal, there's creative illegal ways to uh, address it, but um, to stay in business, uh, there are uh, creative paths to kind of uh, to get around that. And luckily, in the applications that I've been working with, there's been alternatives to, to be able to to handle that. Um, the patent landscape, the rules for getting a patent have improved quite a bit. So that if we went back uh, 30 years ago, at the start of the industry, uh, one can get a patent just for <coughs> retrieving the DNA of the gene for a natural product without introducing anything special into it or about it or any, any sort of value of the investigator other than Yep, it's a natural product and I grabbed it. Those patents were uh, issuable way back when, but now the Supreme Court has ruled that that's not enough of a reason to issue a patent. So the new landscape makes a lot more sense. You have to bring a lot more to the table to be able to claim, uh, to claim a patent on DNA sequence. You have to be able to introduce some sort of proprietary or, or special trick into it. As a, as a follow-up, can you provide an example of a creative way to go around a, a patent? Sure. Um, the, um, 
the current uh, technology you may have seen in, in kind of headlines and in, in different kind of general readership news, there's a new technique uh, that's used for gene editing. Uh, that means the ability to correct the gene in its place. Uh, it has a sequence that's off, uh, it can be corrected, and the acronym is a long, complicated technical name, but the acronym is uh, CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-R. Uh, those licenses to work on that are very expensive, but the proteins that are necessary to accomplish that are, are not covered by patents. So in the case, my company can't afford to take a license out about the DNA part of it, but we instead provide products on the proteins protein components that are necessary to get that job done. So that's how we've been able to avoid that, that very expensive uh, landscape. 